What's stopping you, you, you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? What's stopping you? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You, you, you? you are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey, everybody. Welcome again to Call to Communion. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters, those of you who have questions about the Catholic faith, and maybe you're kind of looking around here and there trying to figure out how to get those questions answered. Maybe you would feel uncomfortable walking into a Catholic church. Well, why don't you call us? We'll be glad to answer those questions. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening outside of North America, you'll need to dial the uh, USA country code and then 205-271-2985. That would also include our friends in uh, Britain and Ireland. Love to hear from you as well. If you're watching us on EWTN television today, you can send us an email, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Another way to contact us, and that would be texting. You can text the letters EWTN to 55000. Uh, Wait for our little quick response and then uh, send us your first name and your brief question. Message and data rates may apply. And then I'll give you one more and then we'll get to it here. And that is YouTube or Facebook. Jeff Burson will be glad to pass on any questions that you might want to pose there. Along with Jeff Burson, uh, who's handling social media for us, we also have Ryan Penny screening the phones. Uh, Michael Birchfield is our producer today. I'm Tom Price, along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Doing very well. How are you, my friend? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. Hey, I'm sure you had a yummy lunch. You are uh, well known around here for eating extremely healthy lunches. Well, a lot of people don't think yummy and healthy is the same thing. But it can be. Well, it, you know, in my book it is. But All right. Glad to hear that. But We're yes, gonna... it was both yummy and healthy. Excellent. We're going to lead off here with a, a question from Johnny. This was posed via Facebook. A friend has expressed interest in how the Bible was compiled, the councils, etc. What books would you recommend to get the inside uh, skinny on this. Uh, this person is a non-Catholic who asks about the faith almost daily. Thanks, Johnny. I recommend the book, Where We Got the Bible, Our Debt to the Catholic Church by Henry Graham. Oh, okay. That, that's the, that's, that's yeah. a great, very accessible read. That's, a one-stop shop? It's a one-stop shop, absolutely. Right. Very good. Here's one from Alan checking us out on YouTube. Do martyrs for the faith automatically go to heaven? What determines whether or not they, quote, qualify as martyrs? Sure. Martyrdom, yes, martyrdom sends you to heaven because you've made the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, we we get to heaven. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for Mm -hmm. they will see God. It's the love of God that unites us to him and fits us for heaven. What holds us back from purity of heart, what holds us back from the love of God is the love of creatures, the, the disproportionate love of creatures. We love our created goods and our own created self more than we love God. Well, martyrdom contradicts all that. I mean, if, you're, if you are literally willing to give up everything for the sake of God, then by definition, you've got what it takes, so to speak. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who dies, uh, at least nominally in defense of religion, is a martyr who has merited eternal life because a person might uh might just might Mm -hmm. submit to such treatment out of a kind of vainglory like Uh their motive might be something other than the genuine love of god but Mm -hmm. if a person were to willingly give up their life in imitation of christ and for the sake of for god's sake and honor and out of love for him then yes that'd be you know your ticket to ride so to speak off you go off you go And what was the other question? Uh, What determines whether or not they qualify as martyrs? Well, I think we answered that. Uh, Then do martyrs for the faith automatically go to heaven? As I've articulated it, yes. Okay, there you go. The church has historically venerated the martyrs and sought their intercession, presuming more or less on their sanctity. Okay. Uh, Alan, thank you for your question uh, submitted via YouTube. We're glad that you're with us. This is called a communion here on EWTN. A couple of lines open right now, 833 288-EWTN. That's 
288-3986. Robin on Facebook wants to know, what is the best way to explain to someone why we could receive Holy Communion every day? The best way to explain to someone why we could, I'm I'm trying to contemplate the reason that someone would give for not doing this. Perhaps a faith tradition that receives the Lord's Supper once a quarter or, you know, once every couple of weeks uh, as a, as a sure. matter of course. Sure, well, I, guess I could think, I, it, sure, I could think of, I could think of maybe three arguments to the contrary, depending on whether you're a Catholic or non-Catholic. Right. There are some Catholics, and there have been movements in Catholic tradition down through the centuries that have opposed frequent communion. The Jansenists in France in the 18th century, for instance, were not big fans of frequent communion because they they had a, an, an overly pessimistic view of human nature and, and an o- overly rigorous view of what, a holiness was required for a proper reception. So they they were Puritans, basically. Mm-hmm. And the church ruled that out a long time ago. Uh, you could also have uh, some some Protestant groups oppose frequent celebration of the sacraments because they're afraid that they will become merely ritualistic, right? And mm-hmm. so they think by infrequent reception, what they do is increase reverence and respect for the sacrament. My experience in such a tradition proved the opposite. Infrequent grossly infrequent reception of the sacraments typically inculcated the attitude that they're unimportant for my spiritual life. If I don't do them but once a quarter, they're not, they're not, they're not very necessary for my daily walk. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was the effect that I got from them. I I think the proper response is the Catholic response. We're not obligated to receive communion on a daily Mm -hmm. basis, but communion, Holy Communion is the sacrament of our abiding in Christ. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you abide in me. That's what Jesus says. It's sure. the sacrament of our abiding in Christ. Every sacrament is a sign. It's more than a sign, but it's also a sign. It teaches us a truth that God wants us to know and then makes that truth real in our lives by the action of the Holy Spirit. What is the truth the sacrament of communion teaches us? That we must abide in Christ. Okay. Once a quarter? I don't think so. We need to abide in Christ always. That's right. Okay. I'm going to give you a softball here before we go to the break. Steve wants I'm to I'm terrible know, at softball. Well, you might like this one. Okay. Uh, this is probably going to be a yes or no question, and I think I know how you're going to answer it. Steve says, Dr. David, do you believe that Jesus loves everyone with an everlasting love? I feel like this is a trick question. It is not a trick question. <laughs> yes, but not in the same way. Oh, we may have to uh, elaborate on that after the break then. We'll also be (laughs) talking with Jeff in Fort Wayne, Bob in Center Valley, Pennsylvania, Alex in Fort Worth. One line open for you right now, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. It's called a communion here on EWTN. Stay with us. And it is called a communion here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Uh, before the break, I thought I was throwing David a softball, but it, I guess it turned out to be a curveball. Uh, this was from Steve checking us out on YouTube, who says, Dr. David, do you believe that Jesus loves everyone with an everlasting love? And I thought the answer would be yes, but you're saying there's a qualification well, there. I said yes, but with a qualification. All right. Sacred Scripture pretty clearly distinguishes those who have entered into a filial relationship with God through charity and Mm -hmm. grace and those that have not. And God loves everyone and desires that they be saved. And to be saved means to come into a relationship of loving friendship with Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants but friends because I have shown you everything that I'm going to do. And that's what you do with a friend. You open up your heart, share with them. Not everybody enjoys that intimacy of friendship with Jesus, and so it would be uh, it would be false to suggest that Christ enjoys a relationship with the damned that is the exact equivalent of the relationship that he would enjoy with the blessed in heaven. In the damned, he loves that they are. He loves the the goodness of their created being, mm-hmm. um, but he hates the fact that their wills are forever turned away from him in hatred. I see. Okay. Thank you for the distinction. And if you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. We're going to begin with Jeff in Fort Wayne, Indiana, listening on Redeemer Radio. Hello, Jeff. What's on your mind today? 
Hello, uh, Dr. Anders. Can you explain what morally, the moral, moral equivalence argument is? And specifically, does the Catholic Church use that argument in its uh, defensive policies of, say, immigration? Thank you. I appreciate the question. Uh, moral equivalence, as I understand the term, is, uh, is an argument that is sometimes uh, invoked in political debate to try to nullify an opposing political party's policy prescription on the ground that, well, you know, the, this position that you're taking is the moral equivalence of dot, 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 yeah. fill in your favorite shibboleth. Mm -hmm. And it's really, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of non sequitur. It's almost it's similar to the two quoque objection. Like, how can you say don't do X because you do Y? You mm -hmm. know, well, I mean, it doesn't matter if I do something that's wrong. It, it's irrelevant to the question of the truth of my affirmation. So sure. moral equivalence in that political context is, may, might make for good rhetoric, but it's bad logic. <laughs> okay. Does the church invoke arguments of moral equivalence uh, in defense of or opposition to policy on immigration or some other, other issue? Well, the church as such almost never gets involved in questions of policy. Now, this or that bishop or this or that bishop's conference might issue statements on political policy. Uh, but the, the universal church doesn't teach dogmatically that this or that political policy is what has to be instantiated in a particular time and space in order for justice to be achieved. Very rarely. I mean, I can think, you know, an issue like the, uh, the, the doctrine of uh, the right to religious liberty mm -hmm. would be one where it, we've got a conciliar statement on that from the Second Vatican Council saying that because of the dignity of the human person, nature of human freedom and so forth, uh, people have to have the the freedom of action, the capacity to develop their relationship with God and have access to information about God and divine revelation and so forth, and constraints on that freedom are, are gross violations of human dignity. Uh, the right to life, you, know, you can't kill people in the womb before they even have seen the light of day. But most of the time the church is not teaching doctrinally on policy positions. And uh, and so it wouldn't invoke moral equivalence or any other moral principle to rule dogmatically about policy. There's room for Catholics to, to be on different sides of a political issue when it comes to policy. There's no room for difference on the moral principles involved. Mm -hmm. we, we, have to, we have to agree on the moral principles like the dignity of the human person, the, uh, the, the primacy, the priority of solidarity. We have to we have to identify with especially with the poor in their plight and seek to better their situation, as well as to seek the, the common good of society. I mean, these are things that we have to all agree on. It doesn't mean we have to come to the same policy prescriptions uh, okay. to implement those values in civil life. Very good. Jeff, thank you so much for your call. That opens up a line for you right now, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. It's called a communion here on EWTN. We're going to go now to uh, Bob in Center Valley, Pennsylvania, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hey there, Bob, what's on your mind today? Thank you for taking my call, Dr. Anders. Uh, my question concerns the Nicene Creed. In the very beginning, we refer to the Father as maker of heaven and earth, but in the next paragraph, referring to Jesus Christ, the Son, uh, as being the one through whom all things are made. What is the difference between the two? Thank you. I appreciate it. So the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 3, speaking of the Word of God, who is God, mm -hmm. who became incarnate in the person of Jesus, says of the Word that all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. Within the, the logic, if you will, the economy of the Blessed Trinity, theologians refer to the Father as the principle. The Father is the principle of the Blessed Trinity. What's a principle? That from which things proceed. And the Son proceeds from the Father by way of filiation, by way of generation. Mm -hmm. The Spirit, we had to make up a word for this because we didn't know how spirits proceed. The Spirit proceeds by way of spiration. The Son by filiation. Filiation, that's the filial relationship of Father to Son. Um, the Father is the source. He's the, he is the principle of the Blessed Trinity, but all co-eternal uh, of one essence, the Blessed Trinity. And so uh, there's a sense in which we speak of, of God the Father as the creator of heaven and earth. Uh, but God does all of his activity in a triune manner. And when we get deep into the internal logic, the internal economy, the Blessed Trinity, we are, of course, dealing in mystery. But the metaphor that the church uses is drawn from sacred scripture that Christ is the word. 
St. Thomas tells us that if we want to understand the relationship of father to son, the best analogy we can come up with would be the word or concept conceived by the intellect. You think about the intellect. The intellect is one thing. My, con my intellect is one thing. My consciousness is one thing. And yet, <clears throat> I can, uh, from within that one unitary consciousness, I can, I can articulate an inner self-concept, a concept of myself, if you will. Mm -hmm. That is, at, at once, at one with me, and yet, uh, there's a distinction there. There's a distinction of relation between the intellect and the intellect's concept of itself thinking itself. St. Thomas says, that's a good analogy for the relationship of father to son. Christ is the eternal word, as it were, proceeding from that divine intellect, which is the divine nature. Eternal, God always thinking himself, right? Coextensive, uh, of one essence, and yet a distinction of relation. And as, as, an art, as an artisan would create, in view of a concept that he formulated of the artifact that he wished to make, first it's in the mind and then it's in reality, not in the, exactly the same way, but we can think analogously of Christ as the principle of rationality of the intelligible universe. So God, the Father, who is the principle of the Trinity, articulating within himself eternally the divine word, which is the archetype, ar archetype of the rationality of the intelligible universe, which is creation. We can see how this language about God, creator of heaven and earth, and Christ through whom things are made uh, but is both derived from revelation and that from our own internal experience, we can, we can begin to grasp some weak analogy about the internal economy of the Blessed Trinity. We hope that's helpful for you, Bob. Uh, some, some kind of Mensa thinking going on there, isn't well, it? Well, it's St. Thomas Aquinas thinking. Yeah. So if you want a, 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 a much cleaner and more philosophically astute, I'm just, I'm just a cheap Thomas knockoff, you know. I would go to St. Thomas and the prima pars of the Summa Theologica. Appreciate your call there, Bob. This is called a communion here on EWTN. We go now to Alex in Fort Worth, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Hey there, Alex, what's on your mind today? Good afternoon, and thanks for taking my phone call. Sure. I have a two-part question. Um, the first part, I think I told the screener, is uh, do we have to be in uh, complete agreement with what the Church teaches, and uh, would we find that in the, and uh, I guess the Catechism? Thank you. Appreciate the question. When you become Catholic, if you become Catholic, you are required to profess faith in all of those things that the Catholic Church declares to be divinely revealed. Catholics and Catholic authorities teach and say many things that don't fall under that designation. I have to believe everything that the Catholic Church declares to be revealed by God. My bishop, or this or that pope, or this or that council may say and do things in an authoritative way without designating them as, as divinely revealed. In, in areas that are not designated as divinely revealed, my, my degree of assent to that statement varies depending on the form of the statement and the context. So um, only certain things require divine and supernatural faith. Let me give you some examples. The dogmas of the church, those formally proclaimed by church councils like the Council of Nicaea teaching the dogma of the Blessed Trinity. That's non-negotiable. Council of Chalcedon teaches that Christ is truly God and truly man, one person, two natures, inseparable, uh, but perfectly conjoined in the person. It's non-negotiable. Christ is true God and true man. Can't, no room for dissent on that. Right. Right. There's a great deal in the church's moral catechesis um, that, uh, uh, that is put forth as to be definitively held. Fornication, wrong. Murder, wrong. Adultery, wrong. All right, no room for debate. Right. Um, there are a lot of issues that Catholic theologians or authorities may have discoursed on in a less authoritative way. Now, your question about the catechism, the purpose of the catechism 
is to guide catechists, is to guide catechists as they present and teach the faith. The weight of the doctrines contained within the catechism varies depending on the source from which those doctrines are drawn. So the catechism cites dogmatic statements from popes and councils mm -hmm. that have the full weight of divine authority. But it may also quote from the writings of a saint, a spiritual writer, or perhaps a prayer of the liturgy or something. Um, that's part of the Catholic tradition, part of the Catholic patrimony. It's been part of the work of handing on the faith down through the centuries, but it lacks that weight designated as something specifically divinely revealed. It doesn't require the same level of assent. What that means is that the catechism is by itself not a sufficient guide. It is not a one-stop shop for everything you could ever possibly want to know about the Catholic faith, answering every question. We are not catechism fundamentalists. Mm. It is a very useful book, it is a very beautiful book, and it is a very edifying book, and it is a sure guide to the heart and mind and teaching of the Catholic Church. But it's not that. It's not, it's not the comprehensive manual on all things Catholic. The comprehensive manual on all things Catholic just is the universal church. Comprehensive of the teaching of popes, councils, and sacred tradition down through the centuries. What that means is it's not a solo sport. Mm. Like there's not a step into the, you, 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 it's not, you can't say, give me the manual. I'll go off in my room and study it and learn how to be a Catholic and know everything there is to know. It doesn't work that way. The process of becoming a Catholic is the process of entering into a family, into a tradition, into a community of discourse, into a, into a, into a moral formation, into a stream of spiritual development, and surrendering myself to that stream. And, and there with my brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers in the faith down for 2,000 years, entrusting myself to the action of the Holy Spirit through the body of the Catholic faithful. And uh, of which the catechism is a useful part, but not the be all and end all. Okay. Alex, thank you so much for your call. Call to communion in progress here on EWTN. Andrea has a, a question she just posted on Facebook. Were Moses, Enoch, and Elijah taken into heaven bodily? Sure. Thank you. So they, uh, Moses was not. Moses was buried. Okay. Um, the sacred text says Moses was buried by God himself. Only God knows where his bones are. Um, Enoch was taken away, Elijah taken up in a whirlwind and the chariot of fire. Um, and, uh, and so beyond that, they sort of vanish from view. We know from the doctrine of Christ's descent into hell that the beatific vision, that full admission to the blessedness of heaven and the angels, is not open to the human race until the ascension of Christ. So what precisely is the status of the physical body of Enoch and Elijah prior to the ascension of Christ? Gosh, that's kind of a stumper, isn't it? That's a good one. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's a good one. Um, presumably, uh, they had some experience of the limbus of the fathers, that, that uh, Abraham's bosom, that, pl that abode of rest and natural delight as they awaited the coming of the righteous one. Um, how that all shakes out, what the metaphysics of that is, and, you know, if I got on a spaceship, went at, out past Jupiter, would I find them? That, that one, I'm going to have to wait till we get there to find out. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, then we'll know fully, even as we're fully known. Right now we see as through a glass darkly. So, Very good. All right, hope that's helpful for you, Amanda. In a moment here, we'll be talking with Gina in New Orleans. She's got a great question. Also, Amanda in Dickinson, North Dakota, listening there on Real Presence Radio. Got a great question as well. Kathy is in Beaver Creek, Ohio. Um, interesting. Also, Denise in Marietta, Georgia, listening on AM 1160, the big station, The Quest, out of Atlanta. Uh, Patty in Longview, Texas, checking us out today on the EWTN app. Looks like we have one line open for you as well. Try to squeeze everybody in on today's show. And that number, 833-288-EWTN, 833-288-3986. It's called a communion. Glad you're with us here on Call to Communion on EWTN. Let's get right back to the phones. We are uh, pretty much sold out on the phones, so we'll 
We'll get back to it here with Kathy in Beaver Creek, Ohio, listening on Sacred Heart Radio. Hey, Kathy, what's on your mind today? Hello, thank you. I'm wondering where the two names of Jesus, Rose of Sharon and Lily of the Valley, came from. Thank you. In the biblical book, The Song of Solomon, these terms are uh, used to apply to the, the, the woman who is the, the lover of, would seem to be, of the sacred writer or the shepherd who's, who's uh, depicted there. But the fathers of the church and medieval theologians understood the Song of Solomon to be an allegory about the, the soul in its love affair with God and Christ or alternately with, uh, uh, with the church and, and its uh, bridegroom, who is Jesus. So uh, really we would apply it allegorically to the church, uh, purified by Christ. Um, and another type or another allegory for the church, of course, is the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we could also apply those terms to her in that context. But the origin of the phrase is the biblical book of the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1. And now you know. Thanks for your call, Kathy. Call to communion here on EWTN. We go to Denise in Marietta, Georgia, listening on AM 1160, The Quest. Hey, Denise, what's on your mind today? Um, in the book of Luke, um, it says um, when when Jesus is presented in the temple, um, Simeon is talking to Mary, and he says, so that, um, and you too will be a sign that will be, oh, no, he will be a sign to be contradicted, parentheses, and you yourself a sword will pierce. Well, I get that. I get that she participated in his suffering. But this part I don't get, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I don't understand that that phrase. That sure. Phrase. That, that's a good question. And and I I, I won't offer you the the definitive answer, all right? I'm not going to give you the definitive answer. And anytime somebody asks me, what does this particular verse of the Bible mean? I can give you my best guess at the moment, but if I had time, I would go consult the consensus of the fathers. And I, I don't have the consensus of the fathers on every biblical verse memorized. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, but that's the way I would do it. I would okay. start with common sense, and then I would go into the patristic commentaries and into St. Thomas's commentaries and things like this. Well, obviously, the the, the the sword piercing the soul of the Blessed Virgin is her solidarity with the suffering of her son when he dies on the cross. And uh, any mother would sympathize immediately. The idea, imagine you're 12 and a half years old and you're betrothed to a guy who's 90. You've taken a vow of virginity. An angel pops up and says, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. And uh, it's not going to go well for him. And uh, people are going to hate him. He's going to be a sign of contradiction, despised by the nation. He's going to be put to death. That's not going to be any party. It's a lot to wrap your head right. around. And you're going to you're going to participate in this. Mm. You know, and if if Mary is full of grace and that means she's full of charity and, you know, a, a deeply charitable and empathetic soul suffers more than one that's selfish yeah. in the suffering of another suffers more in the suffering. And that's pr precisely what empathy enables us mm -hmm. to do is to feel somebody else's pains as if they were our own. It's one of the reasons that Jesus suffered more than any other man. Because he, he literally entered into solidarity with the human race and the sufferings of the human race. So that the thoughts of well, me will be revealed. Well, isn't that, isn't that entailed in the, uh, the whole meaning of redemption that, and the judgment? And the judgment. The final judgment is going to bear openly the thoughts of many. God will be vindicated in the righteous and he'll be justified in the wicked. As he says, blessed are you who have done the will of my father, fed the hungry, clothed the naked, and so forth, enter into the reward of your master, the glory of your master. You folks that hadn't done these things, off you go. And so they'll be rejoicing and they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because in, in God, all things will come to light. And all those things that we spent our lives on that were, you know, you look back and you think, wow, I'm 85 years old and I've spent precisely 40 of those years watching reruns, you know. Uh, that's, and and who who will bring that to light? Well, the church. Saint Paul says we will judge angels. You know that we have a a, a job of judging, within mm -hmm. uh, within the last days. Mary is the first member of the church, so to speak. She is the mother of the church, and her participation in the work of redemption is critical to that final 
justification, vindication of God and the final judgment when the thoughts of all will be laid bare. I was just, I was just thinking about St. Augustine, who, what was the exact quote? He said, you know, I, I want to be holy, I want to get to heaven, but not yet. Oh, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. That's it. That's yeah. it. Denise, thank you so much for your call. Call to communion here on EWTN. Let's go to Patty now in Longview, Texas, listening to us on the EWTN app. Hey, Patty, what's on your mind today? Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. You two gentlemen are um, awesome. I love listening to the program, learned so much. Even though I'm a cradle Catholic, I know very little. I hate to admit it, but... Um, my well, we're all, is, you know, not to interrupt you here, but we're all still learning, aren't we, David? I, I, I was just thinking that. I'm, Every she's, day. She's describing me here. I know very little. You know very little. <laughs> we're just, we're just, somebody called the show one time and said, who do you think you are giving out all this stuff? And we were like, hey, if you know better, that's cool. We're not that's claiming right. to be omniscient or anything. We're just doing the best we can. Exactly. What's your question there, Patty? Um, I was sitting with my kids, my teenagers, um, which I wish that I had a manual, but we were sitting when we were reading Matthew 7, and one of the verses, I was telling them, one of the verses that kind of scares me is when Jesus said, you know, I, um, uh, I get to heaven and he'll say to some of us, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. But before that, he actually says um, that those that are going to go to heaven are the ones that do the will of my father. So my son, who's 15, says to me, well, what is the will of the father? I had no answer except to say, well, I can start with the Ten Commandments. And then he said, well, besides that, everything can be subjective. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. I have to give you some concrete answer so that you don't think that whatever comes to your brain is the will of the Father. Can you help me? Sure. Help? Absolutely. I? I really, yeah, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm wondering how, how your son gets from we've got the Ten Commandments to everything else is subjective. I mean, if we've got the Ten <laughs> Commandments, it ain't all subjective. That's right. I'm going to give you a couple answers. I'm going to give you a biblical answer, and I'm going to give you a theological answer as well. Jesus spent his whole ministry elaborating the depth of the Ten Commandments. In Matthew chapter 5, when he ascends onto the mountain and he gives out the Sermon on the Mount, it is, it's an obvious contradistinction to Moses going up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. And there's a lot of, you heard that it was said, but I say to you, mm. going on in the teaching of Jesus. He, he sets up the Hebraic command, the Mosaic command, and then he gives you a deeper elaboration. So for instance, you've heard that it was said, Thou shalt not kill. But I say, if you say to somebody, you fool, you know, you're in danger of the fires of hell. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you already committed adultery. So he takes the negative command and shows you how to really obey the negative command. You, it requires a positive reorientation of your spirit, of your internal life towards God and neighbor. That really is exemplified in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The merciful, those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is not anything goes subjectivism. In fact, this is a really, really rigorous program of, of internal transformation that requires an extraordinary amount of grace and, and all of our effort. We're to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. St. Peter... Um, his epistle, Second uh, Peter chapter 1, says that we have become participants in the divine nature, all right, so that we can escape the corruption in the world due to evil desires. Therefore, he says, you've got this imprint of the divine nature on your soul. Therefore, add to your faith. Then he gives us a list of virtues, you know, goodness and fortitude and love and compassion and sobriety and chastity and, I mean, on and on and on so that you won't be unproductive in your service of God. And you flip over to chapter 2, and he says anyone who lacks these things, lacks this, this virtuous elaboration, this virtuous cooperation in the grace of God, anyone who lacks these things would be better off never having entered into the path of righteousness. In other words, if you stop at baptism and then don't cooperate with grace and grow in virtue, you'd be better off not being baptized. That's what Peter says. Mm. Okay. So, so from a biblical point of view, 
if you understand the Ten Commandments as Jesus does, it doesn't give you subjectivism. It gives you a life project for the development of an interior life in imitation of Jesus. You know, the most famous devotional book in Catholic history is called The Imitation of Christ. Mm-hmm. That's not a that's not a Sunday only job. Yeah. Imitation of Christ. And to imitate Christ is not like, you know, we we can imitate an admirable person. We can look at Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi or whoever mm-hmm. you whatever civil leader you think is admirable and go, that guy had some good qualities and he was working for some just aims and I'd like to imitate that. That's not what imitation of Christ means. Imitation of Christ means the the complete recapitulation of his divine life and person within my own interior life. From the birth of Christ to his ascension into heaven, that becomes for me the model of perfect humanity that I have to seek to incorporate into my self-concept at every waking moment so that I'm dying with him in baptism and rising again with him to new life every single solitary day. With him, I go into the desert and fast for 40 days, if God gives me the strength, so to speak, to purify my affections and my attachments from the merely creaturely and from the, from the tactile and the sensory. And, ele- and St. Paul says, set your heart not on earthly things, but on the things of God, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This is not pure subjectivism. This isn't loosey-goosey what you want. This is a radical self-program. Now, let me give you a philosophical answer to the same question. What does it mean to be good? What does it mean to develop ourselves? St. Thomas Aquinas, great philosopher of the Catholic tradition, says something like this, says, goodness is just the conformity of thing to its nature, the perfection of a thing according to its nature. Well, that's not loosey-goosey at all. I mean, you've got this human nature. There are certain things objectively, it's not subjective, objectively tend to human flourishing. Let me just start with the obvious. Your kid's a teenager. Maybe the buddies in school smoke. That's just dumb as nails. It's going to kill you. Yeah. It's suicide. It's like it's it's uh, it's slow suicide in a stick. It's just dumb as nails. Alcohol use. I mean, go read the go read the, the 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 scientific literature on what this does to the teenage brain and to you know risk make taking and and longevity and all cause mortality and cancer risk and all the rest of it and risky behaviors. I mean, it's just it's just mm-hmm. dumb as nails. Doesn't accord with human flourishing. It's not subjective at all. It's Go look at the data. Human family. What's best for the human family? You know, let me just ask you, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. If you leave your wife and your kids and run off with the secretary, it's not good for your wife and kids. It's not in accord with the flourishing, the well-being of the human family. It's not sub- nothing subjective about it. It's just, ob- just as objective as the nose on your face. What about the human soul? What's the human soul created for? For knowledge? For freedom. That's what a soul is, knowledge and freedom. All right? You're going to dull your mind with marijuana, enslave yourself to drug addiction, destroy your capacity to know and to choose freely? Doesn't take a rocket scientist to know. Doesn't accord with human flourishing. It's not objectively good for you. It's nothing subjective about it. No. All right. Appreciate your call there, Patty. Thank you so much for it. This is called a communion here on EWTN. You know, if you think about it, there's a lot of news out there, but there's also a lot of news that isn't really news. Uh, I think there was a politician who once called it fake news. Uh, But you don't have to worry when you go to the National Catholic Register. This is a wonderful, wonderful resource if you really want to know what's going on. It is America's most trusted Catholic news source with a comprehensive view of the world from a distinctly Catholic perspective. And right now, you can get six free issues, give it a try, with our compliments. Now, if you like it, you can then subscribe whenever you want at a 35% savings off the newsstand price. So if you want to get started with the National Catholic Register, which I wholly endorse, uh, visit ncregister.com today. Find out how to subscribe, ncregister.com. This is called a communion here on EWTN. Back to the phones now for Nathan in Amarillo, Texas, listening also on the EWTN app. Hey, Nathan, what's on your mind today? Hello, I just wanted to thank you guys for taking my call today. Sure. Um, Dr. David Anders, I wanted to let you know that I'm um, currently reading your book. Um, my girlfriend, who's um, actually trying to become a Catholic, she loves it, enjoys it. So I've learned so much. Um, I appreciate thank that. You. Thank you. Yes, and um, we're trying to come closer in communion with our faith. 
Um, I wanted to explain to her about All Saints Day, which is a holy day of obligation. Um, and in my question, if you don't mind, um, we have to look up a lot of the words you use in your book because uh, they're really big words. <laughs> <laughs> um, we look up a lot of them. I'm just going to say um, I wanted to explain to her what is Holy Day of Obligation, why do we have to go, and why do we venerate these saints, the All Saints Day, and maybe expand on that idea if you don't mind. Sure. I'd love to. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I think the best way to understand a Holy Day of Obligation is this. Many people grew up in a family where mom or grandmom or granddad uh, says, you know, on, uh, on Thanksgiving or maybe it's Sunday afternoon or whenever, I expect everybody over at my place. That's the way it is. Why? We're a family. We're going to celebrate being a family. We're going to get together. And in my family gatherings, it was usually things like um, lemon icebox pie, pecan pie, oh. you know, mm -hmm. roast beef and ham, sure, turkey and sweet potatoes, uh, white rolls, you know, good southern food, and sweet tea. You can't ever leave off the sweet Gotta tea. Gotta have you know, it. That was, that was grandma for you. My grandfather always had... Um, uh, uh, sherbet. He always had grapefruit sherbet oh, in the okay. house, you know. And uh, he said, we're getting together. Yes, sir, we're getting together. Why? That's the right thing to do. Why? Why? It's the right thing to do. I am I not going to go to heaven if I don't go to granddad's? I'm a lousy so-and-so if I don't go to granddad's, <laughs> you know. Well, the church is the family of God. The church is the family of God. We celebrate our family. It's the right thing to do, just like you go to the family reunion. And you'd be a real dud if you didn't. Mm -hmm. You go to the family reunion. Holy Day of Obligation is a family reunion. You celebrate, you know, your father has a birthday. You going to be the one kid that doesn't go to dad's birthday party? Oh. Well, the Saints' Days are birthdays. They're celebrating our brothers and sisters, our cousins and uncles and aunts in the faith, in their glorification, all their solemn mysteries of the faith. All Saints' Day, it's just a party for everybody. All the brothers and sisters in the faith that made it to heaven. You going to be the one kid that doesn't come to granddad's birthday party? Why do you have to go? Well, look, the church, if the church doesn't have the right to stipulate today's the day we're all going to go to church, then you're never going to get everybody together at the same time. True. Somebody's got to be able to do that. You know, yeah. just, you, the principle of unity is authority. Okay. All right. It's not the be all and end all of the Christian life. Charity is the be all and end all of the Christian life. But if you can't even be bothered to go to granddad's birthday party, I mean, how charitable are you, right? Yeah. Now, why do we pray to the saints? Why do we venerate the saints? Simple. They're praying for us. They're united to God in charity, right? The, we know that those united to God in charity, their prayers are more powerful. St. James says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And he goes on to say, you folks aren't getting what you're praying for because you're asking with wrong motives. The saints don't have any wrong motives, they only will the will of God. They're perfectly united to God in charity. So their prayers are the most efficacious. We ask our brothers and sisters in this life to pray for us, and they're the ones who aren't perfected in charity. How much more are we going to ask our brothers and sisters in heaven? And in fact, it's a biblical practice. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, Tobit chapter 12, Second Maccabees chapter 15, Second uh, Kings chapter 13. Lots of passages of Scripture where we see the saints or their relics being efficacious and advancing the prayers of those on earth before the throne of God. So it's a very biblical practice. The church has been doing it for 2,000 years. It's embedded in sacred tradition taught by the church's magisterium. What more do you want? It's good sense. It's love. It's brotherly fellowship. It's communion in the body of Christ. It's taught in the Bible. It's taught by the church. It's handed down by sacred tradition. And there's no good reason not to do it. Yeah. You know, so for all those reasons, we ask the saints for their prayers. And uh, regarding the holy days of, uh, of obligation, in our family, we refer to them as the holy days of opportunity. Holy days of opportunity. We get to go. Right. Nathan, thank you so much for your call. Called Communion in Progress here on EWTN. Gina is in New Orleans listening on Catholic Community Radio. Hey, Gina, what's on your mind today? Yes, Dr. David Anders and Mr. Price, thank you for your show. It's my favorite on EWTN. Thanks, but, um, my question <laughs> You're welcome. Um, my question today is I have a friend who is Baptist, says he will not become Catholic because the church is corrupt, it's, um, and that Martin Luther was right for reforming the church and breaking off and starting the Protestant Reformation because it was co corrupt back then, it's still corrupt. So um, I'm calling to see if you can recommend a book that kind of gives a good um, view of what really happened during the Reformation 
And also, this is unusual, but he's Baptist. He's married to a Catholic friend of mine, and he goes to church with her, and he's upset because he can't receive communion because he says he believes that that truly is the body and blood of Christ, and he doesn't understand why the Catholic Church won't allow him to receive communion. But So anyway, if you could recommend a book, especially on the Reformation and Martin Luther's faults, because he thinks he's the greatest thing, that, that that's what we needed in the Church. Okay, I, I appreciate. Um, thank you very much. So, first of all, it's curious to me that your friend would say Luther was right to leave the Church because the Church was corrupt. Um, let me tell you why that's curious to me. Luther himself adamantly denied, adamantly denied that that was why he was leaving the church. Adamantly denied it multiple times in many places. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking of the, the book On the Bondage of the Will that he wrote in 1525, in which he said that purgatory and indulgences and the papacy and things like this were mere trifles and not worthy of debate. Mere trifles and not worthy of debate. Luther said that he would get down on his knees and kiss the Pope's hands and feet if only the Pope would teach his doctrine of justification by faith alone. Luther adamantly rejected the charge that he was leaving the church because it was corrupt. Luther was too good a church historian and, believe it or not, too good a theologian to say something so idiotic. Pardon wow. me. Pardon me. Most people who believe that the Reformation was a response to corruption have have just not read the history. It wasn't, yes, there was corruption in the church. Yes, there's corruption in the church today. Guess what? There was corruption in the church of the apostles. That's right. Go read the book of 3 John in the New Testament. 3 John, little short book, like one chapter long. John's writing against a bishop in Ephesus named Diotrephes. Why? Diotrephes was corrupt. Go read the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Everybody was corrupt in Corinth. Why does Paul write the letter? They're corrupt as the day is long. Um, look, it went all the way up the chain of command. In the book of Galatians, chapters 1 and 2, Paul tells us that St. Peter was getting in on the act. Mm. That In Antioch, he pulled back and refused to eat with Gentiles. Why? Out of fear. Why? Because a bunch of guys from Jerusalem who'd been sent by the Apostle James were making noise about eating with Gentiles. And Peter caved. Wow. Corrupt. Mm -hmm. It wasn't for money, but it was out of craven fear. Corrupt. Uh, well, Judas. Go, Judas. Sure, sure. Jesus names him. He's one of the apostles. He's selling Jesus out for money. Corrupt. Church has always been corrupt, always will be corrupt to the end of time. And, uh, and I guarantee you, if we did a little creative forensic accounting on your Baptist friend's books... If not his congregation, there's 50 others where you're going to find some monkey business. Sure. Corrupt. All right. You're never going to have a human institution free of corruption unless you find a human institution free of humans who sin. Good luck with that. So good luck with that. Yeah. Now, um, there, are, there are so many books, so many books. Can I cheat? Sure. I want to cheat. Okay. If you go to the website of the Office of Religious Education for the Diocese of Birmingham. See, this is where I work. Yes. Look up the YouTube page. Um, I gave a lecture one year ago on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation called Why Was There a Reformation? And uh, it's in two parts. There's two different videos. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I will give you a, a lot of detailed information that'll help. I also have a little article just called Why Was There a Reformation that you can search for my name online and find that's about, you know, 800 words long to spell some of that out. Um, when it comes to good books on, on Reformation history, mm -hmm. it's hard to know where to start. I like the book by Stephen Osmond, Stephen Osmond, uh, called The Age of Reform. Osmond's not a Catholic. He's actually a Protestant. Uh, but I think he does a pretty good job of spelling out that there's a complex social and intellectual history leading up to the Reformation. The Reformation is not didn't just pop out of nowhere. It didn't it didn't just emerge because one guy read the Bible and got some creative ideas. There was a there was about a 400 year social, intellectual, political, cultural movement uh, uh, preceding the Reformation, and it's only in light of those antecedents that we can make sense of it. And let me leave you with a thought. Okay. Protestants often will naively assert 
that the Reformation happened because the Reformers discovered the Bible. Now, if that were true, you would think that you would have had Reformations like the Lutheran Reformation popping up everywhere throughout the world where there was a Bible. Coptic Egypt, Ethiopia, North Africa, the Jerusalem, Church of Jerusalem, Mm -hmm. Byzantium, Greece, Serbia, Moscow, Assyria, the Nestorians of Western China, the Syro-Malabars in India. But we only find Protestantism in Northwest Latinate Europe in the 16th century. Why? It doesn't come out of the Bible. It comes out of a very particular historical set of circumstances that were unique to that time and place. See you next time right here on EWTN's Call to Communion. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Have a great day.